Hi everybody, this is a presentation about the axial modes of a laser. To explain the concept of the axial modes, we take a closer look into the optical cavity of the laser. And to have light amplification in there, we need the photons in the optical cavity to travel back and forth between the mirrors so that they can evoke stimulated emission in more and more atoms of the lasing medium. Let's have again a closer look at that point where the light in the optical cavity is reflected by the mirror. Where light is incident on a mirror at a minimum of the wave or maximum equally as it's shown by the red line, the light will be reflected and phase shifted due to total reflection as the green line shows. Note that incident and reflected light now cancel out each other, as the arrows indicate. Thus we get destructive interference. Another way the incident light could be reflected is shown in the next drawing. It's somewhere between a minimum or a maximum and a node of the wave. Again, we get a phase shift while the reflection about 180 degree. And again, as the arrows indicate, there are some points we get constructive interference and some points we get destructive interference. A third way light can be incident on a mirror is to have the nodes a wave exactly where the mirrors are. So we again get reflection and a phase shift and that makes the incident and reflected light to interfere constructively. Incident and reflected light form a standing wave in the optical cavity and an increase in intensity is the result. The following animations show a single standing wave formed within the cavity of our laser. Only waves that have a node at the position of a mirror will interfere in a constructive way, thus resulting in the actual amplification effect of the laser. As we will see, this can occur in many different ways. While the length L of the cavity stays the same, the frequency or wavelength lambda of the wave happens to change in such a way that again a node is at the position of a mirror. If you go back to the first animation, you will see that the first mode, the distance of two adjacent nodes, fit exactly the edge of the cavity, but this is only half the wavelength. So, to put some math on it, we change the explanation into a nice formula. So, the length of the cavity has to be equal half of the wavelength times an integer. So, the modes are discrete. From our physics lecture, we recall the relationship between the frequency nu and the wavelength lambda as the product is equal to the speed of light. If we rearrange this formula and plug it in, we can eventually predict the frequencies of the modes appearing in the cavity. Can we say anything about the distribution of the frequencies then? Yes, we can. Apparently, they should be equally spaced due to the fact that they are discrete. So we can derive an expression for the frequency distance. If we take a look at the distribution of those frequencies in the frequency domain, we only can see discrete or very sharp peaks then. That's shown in the picture the game Purple G gets its Gaussian-like shape from the effect of the line broadening, which means that the outcoming intensity of the laser consists of some modes, that is photons with different frequencies. But only those modes that exceed the losses in the laser will contribute to the intensity. If you change the gain threshold, so the conditions at which lasing occurs, you can actually control the number of modes in the intensity distribution. Also note the distance between two modes on the screen. 
including today we have learned why there are actual modes in a laser cavity, how they look like, and how they are contribute to the intensity of a laser. Thank you very much for your attention.